the Liberal government has finally admitted to what we've been saying all along about the buyback. But what did they say? And does the buyback program violate your chartered rights? Let's have a look. Quick disclaimer before we continue. This video will be speaking a lot about the government's ongoing plan for confiscating our firearms. In this video, as well as in many other places on my channel, I will be referring to it as their buyback program. But to be clear, I'm not saying it is a buyback program, and I'm not calling it a buyback. I'm simply using their terminology because it's the official name for their program. So even though we all know that that term and that label is crap, and that this is nothing short of a confiscation regime, it doesn't change the fact that they've named the program what it is. So keep in mind that when I do use that term, I'm not calling it a buyback. I'm merely referring to their program by its official name. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be taking a look at some more buyback news. I've already done two videos recently on this. Uh, one I did a couple of weeks ago, which I explained the new changes regarding the amnesty for the buyback. And a lot of you have probably seen Runkle's video on that, if you haven't seen mine. And But they both say roughly the same things. I also did another video about a month ago talking about the current state of the buyback and what we're going to talk about today kind of really builds on that video. Speaking of Runkle, I was watching him a few weeks ago and he said something that I thought was rather curious, but then he just didn't expand on it. So let's take a look at what he said. But they've decided that they're going to roll this out during election season. Why would they do that? Well, um, a source who was, of course, unnamed was quoted as saying there are progressive votes that we need it's going to happen. Of course, we always knew that's what this was about. It was never about public safety. It's always been about securing votes by dividing Canadians against each other on issues that have nothing to do with public safety. There are progressive votes that we need. It's going to happen. However, he didn't source his claim, which is fine. That's really not an issue, especially since it's not really the focus of his video or anything but he kind of just glossed over it and just goes on with his video, despite the fact that I think that that's a rather shocking development in the buyback saga. So I did some searching and I found this article here. This article is from the CBC and it's titled, Ottawa plans to launch controversial firearms buyback program during election year. And if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, this is where we see our quote. It says, there are progressive votes that we need, said a liberal source, it's going to happen. They said this in relation to their planned buyback program. This liberal source remains anonymous in the article, but CBC says it's a federal government source. And this really just confirms what we've known all along, and the liberal government is finally agreeing with us by saying the quiet part out loud. The bulk of the article itself details a rough framework and timeline for the buyback. Now, when I say rough, I, I really mean borderline non-existent. It's really still more of an idea or a concept at this point. There are several places in this article where the government sources say that the buyback is only a few months away, and then other places where it says it won't happen until next year. Now, our source claims that the variable time frame is the result of Canada Post just suddenly refusing to run the buyback, which, which is, of course, ridiculous. Canada Post did say no a few months ago, and then no again a few weeks ago, but they also said no to helping several years ago. Now, I already covered this in one of my previous buyback videos, but this is really not a new problem. The government is also looking at having law enforcement partake in the confiscation, as was their original plan all the way back in 2020, but law enforcement still hasn't changed their mind on the matter. So even considering that no one wants to help with this program, the government seems hell-bent on pushing it through. I guess this must mean that there are no provincial governments or police services out there who are interested in keeping Canadians safe. I mean, it's, it's either that or it would mean that the Liberals are lying about their motivation for the buyback program, but surely they wouldn't lie to us simply for political gain when Canadian lives and freedoms are on the line, right? The article further explains that any buyback program which might be rolled out would have to be implemented on like a province-by-province -province basis. Now, it's no secret that most provinces said no to helping with the buyback, citing problems with lacking resources and ineffective use of police manpower. But some take it a step further. Some provinces, like Alberta and Saskatchewan, have outright told the federal government to get bent by enacting their own firearms acts in order to directly interfere with the buyback in meaningful ways in the hopes that the government will back down. With this in mind, our article also goes on to tell us that the sources said the government is aware that using police officers to operate the buyback program is not the most effective use of policing resources, and as such, the federal government is considering the idea of hiring private security firms. The government is also then considering creating drop-off points where owners could return their weapons. 
And for anybody who heard that, you heard that right, and you should be concerned. The private security firms? Like, are they going to use them only as drop-off points or as part of the confiscation regime itself? Like, drop-off points are one thing, but if it's their plan to be hiring private security and to go, like, door to door to door to take guns away from law-abiding citizens, they are essentially saying that they plan to use armed mercenaries against citizens to enforce the law because the police won't do it. Which is... <laughs> That's wild. As crazy as our liberal government is, hopefully even they have the sense to not be doing that. Now, whatever they decide on doing, there has been a lot of buzz in the last few months, both from this article as well as several others, saying the business portion of the buyback is just a few months away and will be rolled out before the end of the year. But they've also been saying that for several years now. It was something Marco Mendicino promised multiple times while he was public safety minister, and he hasn't been running the show for nearly a year now. Two years ago, we banned AR-15s and other assault-style weapons. We also committed to a mandatory buyback program to get these weapons off of our streets once and for all. And today, I can confirm the imminent launch of the initial phase of this program. The first AR-15s and other assault-style firearms will start to be bought back by the end of this year. It's going to be hard, but we are going to get it done. So as you can see, it was imminent two whole years ago now. Tens of millions of dollars have been spent and zero progress has been made since then. However, this time around, I do think it does seem more likely. Public Safety Canada's website has a page regarding their buyback program which says... The program designed for the firearms buyback program is underway, including the development of an IT processing system. This is that job posting from the RCMP for a tech position with a higher duration of one year, and one of the jobs will be to design and implement the firearms compensation program system integration. Additionally, with the plethora of ongoing scandals they've been going through over the last year, and the severity of the current ones, the Liberals are really going to need every distraction tool in the shed to get through it in one piece. On top of that, they just lost a critical by-election in Toronto in a long-held liberal riding. And let's not forget, large-scale gun bans have been, and still are, one of their key election platforms. And our next planned election is only a little over a year from now. The topic of gun control and the weather, <laughs> of all things, are really the only two legs the liberals have left to stand on. And that rhetoric is starting to ramp up as well. I mean, just last week, Environment Canada released a scary-looking red picture to trick Canadians into thinking we're going to have ourselves an evil hot summer. But if you look at the legend on the graph, these colors don't actually represent heat. They're representing the likelihood to experience above-average temperatures. Which, if you know anything about statistics and averages, you should expect to see a graph like this about every other year. And the buyback program is the same kind of nonsense. So you can certainly expect it to be the crutch that the Liberal government will lean on in order to get through the rough waters they're in, if they can. So if ever they were going to do it, now would be the time. However, at the end of the day, all of the measures that they may or may not impose on us and businesses for the confiscation remain essentially optional. The current amnesty still extends to beyond the next election, which the Liberals are almost certainly to lose at this point, meaning that while the mandatory program itself is actually not optional, the politicians who are running the program are going to be out of a job before our deadline. If and when the Conservatives win the next election, they can get to work changing this whole mess before we're criminalized just simply for existing. All of this is to say that the current buyback plan really isn't much of a plan. It's likely to be more of a token buyback just for them to be able to say that they're finally doing it, which, as they're now admitting, is merely for election and voting purposes. If and when they do this buyback, it's going to be sloppy, disorganized, and likely different even from province to province, or even from one region to another. Some provinces, like Alberta and Saskatchewan, might not even have a functional program when this rolls out, thanks to how their own legislation directly opposes it. This buyback will be forced, rushed, wasteful, incomplete, and, most importantly, nearly five years removed from its original announcement date back in May of 2020. Which brings me to the other half of this video. Five years is a long time. I think this delay, in and of itself, should be a charter violation. Well, I mean, frankly, I think the 2020 OIC violates actually quite a few sections of the charter. The CCFAR in their court case last year brought up several sections. They brought up sections 1, 7, 8, 11, 15, and 26 as possible charter violations. Now, some of those I argue with, and some of those I don't, but I'll go over most of those in more detail in my review of their court case, which should be out in a few weeks here. Be sure to get subscribed and stay tuned if that's something you're curious about. 
However, the one I want to talk about today is one that they didn't actually mention. Now, the violation I'm talking about is also under Section 11, but the violation isn't a result of the prohibition itself, but rather a violation due to how delayed the buyback has been. Now, Section 11 of the Charter is actually rather long and encompasses a whole bunch of different little things. So the Section 11 portion used by the applicants in the CCFR's case is not the same one that I'm going to be using here, although, and spoiler alert, it'll fail for the same reason. That being said, I do think it's absolutely still worth discussing. So I plan to use Section 11B. So this is Section 11 of the Charter. Section 11B is, says, any person charged with an offense has the right to be tried within a reasonable time. And this section exists for a very good reason. That reason is to prevent the government from using perpetual delays in prosecution as a form of punishment. This is often referred to as using the process as punishment. For example, let's say somebody's charged with a crime, and as a result of those criminal proceedings, the government freezes some of the accused assets which they believe are directly linked to the commission of those crimes, either as a source or a reward for those crimes. Now, the government in Canada can't normally just confiscate your property or your money without proof of a crime, but they can freeze your money or assets if you've been charged with a related crime pending a criminal trial, or if you set up bouncy castles in the capital. However, if you're found to be innocent or if the charges are dropped, your stuff will be unfrozen. As such, it would be unjust to just be charged with a crime and to have your assets, your money, or your property frozen in perpetuity pending a trial, which is just never going to happen. That would essentially be the same thing as confiscation. It would be one thing to have inventory tied up for a few months during a trial, even if you've done nothing wrong, but it could very easily force you out of business to have inventory, assets, or money just frozen in perpetuity forever, which is not so different from what is happening currently to us firearm owners, and in particular, to various gun store owners. The government can't just normally confiscate their stuff without compensation or cause, so they said they would do a buyback. But until the buyback is complete, their assets are, are essentially frozen by the government. They can't be sold, used, traded, or anything of the sort, and this has caused a number of firearm businesses to go directly out of business as a result of these perpetually frozen assets. Which is, and clearly that's unjust and just unfair. Which is why, under Section 11b, there is a finite time limit before which the government must bring you to trial. And that limit is laid out in the current framework under the trial of the Crown versus Jordan in 2016. The limit is 18 months for summary convictions and 30 months for indictable offenses. For those unfamiliar with Canadian law, these are sort of like the American categories of misdemeanors and felonies. I mean, they're not exactly the same, but if it helps you to think about it that way, they're close enough for the purposes of this video. This paragraph goes on to say that the 30 month ceiling also applies if the accused re-elects a trial in the provincial court after a preliminary inquiry. This means that if the total delay from the charge to the trial exceeds the numerical ceiling, then the delay is presumptively unreasonable. Now, presumptively unreasonable, meaning that we can assume any delay beyond two and a half years is unreasonable simply because of the delay. The buyback is already over four years old now, and before the program actually starts confiscating anything, it could be very easily four and a half, maybe even five years old, which is double the unreasonable limit. However, this is a rebuttalable presumption. To rebut it, the Crown must demonstrate that there were exceptional circumstances for the delay. Now, they could try to rebut this by saying that they are facing, you know, exceptional circumstances, since no one wants to help them, and it's been borderline impossible to get a program going because of that. I mean, that would certainly be an appropriate explanation for the delays, except for one major problem. They've been claiming for years now that they did their homework and that the majority of Canadians have said that they want this. This was even a direct part of the original justification for the 2020 Prohibition Order in the first place. They claim extensive public engagement on the issue of banning handguns and assault-style firearms took place between October 2018 and February of 2019, with the provinces and territories, municipalities, indigenous groups, law enforcement, community organizations, and the industry. So, according to the government, they did their homework. They asked all the relevant parties, and everyone was on board with the program. They can't then go back on that and say that this lack of participation is somehow unexpected or an exceptional circumstance, as the reason for this delay, because if they did, this would be a direct invalidation of their justification for the OAC in the first place. So either they did their homework right and there's no excuse for a five-year delay, or they've been lying about the prohibition order since before day one. Now being that we're getting pretty close to double even the maximum 30-month time frame by the time the buyback gets here, and seeing as they have no reasonable or justifiable rebuttal, what's the normal remedy for charter violations of Section 11b? 
If the Crown is unable to demonstrate the presence of exceptional circumstances, it will be presumed that the delay was unreasonable and the remedy for a Section 11 violation is a stay of the proceedings. Or in our case, an end to the buyback program. It says here, according to the Supreme Court of Canada, the most appropriate and just remedy for people who have had their Section 11b rights infringed is to stay the proceedings against them. Or, in our context, that'd be a stay of the buyback, effectively nullifying the prohibition order of May 2020. That would be the Supreme Court approved fair and just thing to do based on our charter rights. Now, unfortunately, like I said at the start of this, the law just doesn't work that way. There is one very obvious problem with this argument, and it's the same reason why the Section 11 challenge didn't work in the CCFR's court case either. Even though this argument makes perfect sense conceptually, Section 11 offers its protection only to those who have been charged with an offense. And as it stands now, we have not been charged with a crime, nor are we even remotely suspected of any criminal wrongdoing. But here's the thing, shouldn't that offer us like more protection and not less? Can the government really persecute us more easily explicitly because we're not criminals and have done nothing wrong? Like that doesn't make much sense to me either. This is just one of many examples in our country that show how law-abiding gun owners are afforded fewer protections and legal rights than even criminals in our society. And if that's not just blatant prejudice and discrimination against our minority group, then I don't know what is. So, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Do you think this argument should hold water, or am I just grasping at straws? And what do you think about the government finally admitting that this is actually just all about votes? I mean, this is not exactly news to us, but I think it's certainly shocking that they've gone so far as to say that out loud. Also, say goodbye to this camera and to my blurry footage in general, as I'll be finally filming with my new one from now on. So hopefully you'll be looking forward to me in all my high def glory. And lastly, I do want to give a shout out to my last video. It got buried pretty hard by the YouTube algorithm, so a lot of you probably haven't even seen it. But in it, I covered the Sydney Island deer call story. I did a pretty thorough and in-depth breakdown of exactly what's going on over there, as well as what a lot of news stories get wrong on the matter. So if that's of interest to you, be sure to go check it out. All that being said, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.